The next thing I wanted you to talk a little bit about was um, I had been here one year and we, you decided or we were able to do the Scripps ADF Award. And that was a really, really big thing in dance, and it was a really big thing for Durham. So I want you to talk a little bit about that and to talk about how you met Sam Scripps. I have to go back in about 60, 61. I was still living in Denmark, but I was spending a lot of time here. I worked at the Pillow in 1661. My mentor, Isadora Bennett, became director, the first director of the Asia Society Performing Arts Program. And she sent me to Asia to make arrangements for those groups that her panel decided to bring and look for new groups to bring in the future. One of the groups they decided to bring was Balasara Swati, the greatest Bharatanatyam dancer of the 20th century. And so I went to Madras and I met her. She was a little hesitant the first day. I went back the second day. First day she wouldn't speak English, we had an interpreter. The second day she started to speak English. Anyway, we made the arrangements for the tour. They performed in San Francisco. And a couple went to see them. Louise Scripps and Sam Scripps. Louise, who loves to be called Lulu, had her mind blown by Bala became an, a, a disciple of hers, learned Bharatanatyam, went to study with her in India, and they su helped support her. This is Scripps from Scripps Howard, Sam. I guess during the winter of 77, I get a call from a woman that I'd never heard of or knew about, and said, my name is Louise Scripps. I am Balasaraswati's manager. Would you like to have her at the ADF? Nancy, this is a true story. It doesn't sound true. I'm on the phone. I literally got off my chair, got on my knees and said, lady, I'm on my knees. What do I have to do to make this happen? We had a special institute for her. The biggest problem was finding a studio with a stone floor. I finally found one with basement. We <laughs> had some windows, thank goodness. And students came to study with Paula. And Louise spent the summer there too. She wasn't living where most of us lived, which was, you know, on campus in those little houses they had. I said, where are you staying, Louise? She said, oh, I got a little place on the water. So I thought, hmm. <laughs> and I said, what does your husband do? And she said, oh, he's a stage manager, lighting designer. And I remember the thought, I thinking, lady, I hope you have money to support him. <laughs> okay. She says, you know, you must come out to California to see us. Six months later, I get a call. She said, this is Louise Scripps. I said, hi, how are you? She said, look, I'm in town with my husband, Sam, and he would like to meet you. I said, great, come on up for lunch. We'll order out some sandwiches. And you know, I had my round table then, that white round table. And Sam doesn't speak much, but I immediately liked him. He's very direct. And when he speaks, it's very direct. And it's a little effort, but it's very direct and very intelligent. So we're sitting around the table, and we order out tuna fish sandwiches or whatever they want. In the middle of it, my secretary comes in and says, there's a call from the National Endowment for the Arts. I said, you have to excuse me. I'm waiting to hear about this grant. I take the call. I hang up the phone. I come back, and I say, those damn fools wouldn't recognize talent if it fell on their laps. They just turned me down for a $10,000 grant for Laura Dean. Ten days later, I get a check in the mail for $10,000 for Sam Scripps. This had never happened. I call him and I said, Sam, I didn't know. He said, I know. We became really fast friends and I said, look, Sam, when I'm coming to talk to you about business, I will make a separate appointment. And we became very good friends because they decided to move to New York. The award. Capizio was the only award that existed which came with a few dollars. It came with a thousand dollars then. I was so upset by everybody giving awards and there was no <laughs> checks with them. The choreographers need money to make dances. They don't need things to put up on their wall. Right on, right on. 
So I thought, so I called Sam and said, I want to come to see you officially. And I said, can't we establish a Samuel H. Scripps American Dance Festival Award for Lifetime Achievement for Modern Dance Choreographers at $25,000? He said, let me think about it. I didn't hear from him. It was getting close to the season where we had to announce things and get things together. I tracked him down in New Orleans and I said, Sam, I'm sorry to call you like this, but if we're going to do it, I need to know now. He said, yep. I said, does that mean yes? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then what we would do, he would surprise us each year by giving us more money than we had the year before. And he would get such happiness out of that. He didn't know the happiness I got out of it. <laughs> Extraordinary. The amazing thing, and I have to say this, I saw him about 24 hours before he died in his apartment. He was kind of in a little bit of a coma in this chair, big chair. And he came to and came forward and said, hello. And he reached out and took my hand. Sam never touched. And he said, thank you. And I said, no, Sam, thank you. And then he died the next day. Well, Charles, one of the amazing things that you did, though, was you got Sam to speak at the awards, which I don't know that he had spoken very much publicly. Like That's you right. said, he, does, he wasn't a big talker That's just, right. you know, in regular life. But he seemed really pleased yeah. with himself to be able to get up on stage and to say a few words and to have this audience that was just so grateful to him, you know, for his support of ADF and... He had an inner youthful love of life. And when he came out on that stage and smiled at the audience, they all got it. <laughs> it was so pure. They loved him, didn't they? They loved and him. And you remember what he did for Nikolai? You have to know Nikolai's work. Nikolai was kind of the pioneer of technology in the arts. And if you look at his dances, that's what they were about. And lighting was very important. Lighting was very Costume, important. Costume, very important. Visual that, elements, That's very right. And, and films on the dancers' bodies, you know, and all those kinds of things. And so Sam wore a bow tie, which he pressed a button down here, and the bow tie lit up and started going across making these images. The audience went skyward, didn't they? So talk a little bit about the first award. Oh. The first award went to Martha Graham, as it should. And Betty Ford, who was one of her students in the Bennington years, we contacted and she agreed to give it because she adored Martha. During the winter, we had our offices on Duke's campus in the old art building. And they, we had this funky little attic that they gave us to store things in. And so I had to get in there and look for her folder from 1935 or Did you ever find it? Yeah, we found something. I'm oh. not sure we found very much information, but we found something that Betsy Bloomer. That's right because her name was not Betty Ford. It was Betsy Bloomer. And um, so anyway, that was it was just that was all the whole thing was very kind of magical the way it kind of came together because we didn't have a whole lot of lead time. You right. were calling Sam and then you just went, "Okay, we are, we got to the go ahead. So anyway, so keep going. So anyway, Bill Friday, who was then the president of UNC, offered those wonderful little digs they have over there at Moorhead. Right. The special guest rooms that's at right. Moorhead Planetarium. That's right. That's to right. Put up Betty Ford and Martha Graham. Now, Secret Service is around. This is 1981, right? Okay. Got that year. And we're all in the theater, but there's no Martha Graham yet, no Betty Ford, 
and we're trying to figure out where they are. This is before cell phones and everything, right? The excuse, the official excuse they gave was the hairdresser. They blamed it on the hairdresser, <laughs> right? That Martha wanted to use, that Betty Ford had brought her own hairdresser and Martha wanted to use her services. And of course, Martha Graham gets up and says, not once, but twice, at Palmer Auditorium at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, how wonderful it is to be here, to be back here in Chapel Hill. <laughs> well, I was sitting behind the Sanfords, and Mrs. Sanford's hair went up in the back of her neck as she banged Terry's arm. Twice. <laughs> so that was a very auspicious beginning. Well, Charles, I also remember that they, uh, you know, we had to negotiate with the Graham Company and talk, and you know, talk about how they wanted to send this set piece. So talk a little bit about the... I mean, well, you helped me here, but I remember one instructions was, the curtain will go up and Martha will be revealed. <laughs> right? That was what my else favorite. do you remember? I remember that the chair, they said, we're sending a chair for Martha to sit in. And we said, oh, well, we have plenty of chairs for her to sit in. And they said, no, we're sending the chair for Martha to sit in. And it came and it was this huge thing. And it weighed like a ton or something. And the tech crew, the production crew, was just beside themselves saying, this is this huge thing. And, you know, we weren't really prepared for this. And we've got plenty of chairs. And it was a throne. It was I mean, a it throne. was. <laughs> well, you have to understand Martha Graham. This one comment, I think. She was on stage right once, and somebody said, Martha, why aren't you on center stage? She says, wherever I am is center stage. <laughs>